scripture reading today is in 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 17. <clears throat> Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God again quarreling about words. It is not, <clears throat> it is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to prevent yourself present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly <clears throat> handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter, chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teachings will spread like gangrene. So be it. My mama always told me that when people pick on you, it's because they want to be like you. Just saying. <laughs> we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that we can come into your house and freely worship you. Lord, we do thank you for the clear skies. We thank you for the oxygen that we tend to take for granted. And we thank you so much that we are bound by your spirit, that we know that we have an eternal inheritance in heaven waiting for us. And Lord, help us to live our eyes fixed on Jesus, to live a life that brings glory and honor to you, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow after Jesus. Open our hearts and minds today to hear your word, Lord. Help us to be a light to this world. Help us to be bound together with unity of love and spirit of one mind in this church. And we just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So for you that have this Bible, I'm going to read a little bit out of it. Um, I'm on page 1910 is where I'm at. And if you didn't know it, in the back is a book by book section where you can read about each particular book of the Bible. And I'm going to read a little bit about 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. So on the one of 1 Timothy, it says, Without trying, we model our values. Without even trying. Now Merle kind of jumped the gun on... Um, this week's reading because he asked me a question out of 2 Timothy chapter 3 today, which you should read Monday. But it's the same topic that we've heard over and over and over in the church. We fight a spiritual battle, and that spiritual battle is even going to rage inside of the church. Because if Satan can't have you, he's certainly going to try to tear you down where you're ineffective. And he's going to try to tear down the whole body of Christ by attacking each and every part and then the whole body. So don't be surprised when there are false doctrines and, and hypocrites in the church. Nothing has changed. And what we have to do in 2 Timothy chapter 3 is like Paul said in Corinthians, you have to get rid of that hypocrisy out of the church. Which means you have to get rid of the individual even if they don't change. But you've got some guidelines on how to handle them and everything. Because as, pa as Paul's word said that Merle finished reading, if you don't, it's like gangrene. Now what happens with gangrene? It kills the flesh. It spreads to you the point where you have to cut it out or it kills you. And that's what we have to do with the hypocrisy that's in the church. And this is without trying, without even trying, we model our values, what's important to us. Parents in particular demonstrate to their children what they consider important and valuable. Like father, like son, is not just a well-known cliché. And in 2 Timothy, he's going to mention cliché again. It is a truth that is repeated in our homes. Children often, often follow the lifestyles of their parents, repeating their successes and their mistakes. Timothy is a prime example of one who was influenced by godly relatives, his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois. Timothy is the first second generation Christian mentioned in the New Testament, whether you realize that or not, and becomes Paul's protege and the pastor of the church at Ephesus. Paul sends him this very personal letter. 
Paul wrote 1 Timothy in about A.D. 62, and that may coincide with this. We don't know exact dates. We have to kind of piece those dates together by clues that we get in Scripture and the um, guideline that we kind of have in Acts. And that's why we think, which I'll get to it, that 2 Timothy is probably Paul's last letter, period, because he's facing execution. And it's not a letter written to a church. It's a letter written to one disciple. And I challenge you to think about that. And I ask you, who are you discipling to follow after you, to keep the gospel message alive, especially in your family for generation to generation to generation to come? This was not long after he was re released from his first Roman imprisonment. We don't know this for sure, but it seems like Paul was arrested in Rome, released, and arrested again because of what we see in his writings and some clues there. It was probably because he had appealed to, P to Caesar. Paul had been sent to, as a prisoner to Rome, and you can refer to Acts 25 to 28, those chapters, to see that. Most scholars believe that Paul was released about A.D. 62, possibly because the statute of limitations had expired, and that during the next few years he was able to travel again. During this time he wrote 1 Timothy and Titus. Soon, however, Emperor Nero began his campaign to eliminate Christianity. It is believed that during this time Paul was imprisoned again and eventually executed. <clears throat> during his second Roman imprisonment, Paul wrote 2 Timothy, Titus and to, uh, Titus also, and these are called his pastoral letters. First Timothy holds many lessons. If you're a church leader, take note of Paul's relationship with his young disciple, his careful counsel and guidance. Measure yourself against the qualification that Paul gives for elders and deacons. If you are young in the faith, follow the example of godly Christian leaders like Timothy, who imitate Paul's life. If you're a parent, remind yourselves of the profound effect a Christian home can have on family members. A faithful mother and grandmother led Timothy to Christ, and Timothy, Timothy's ministry helped change the world because he carried on the torch, which you read about this week, the fanning of the flame. So we started this week with 1 Timothy chapter 4. We read chapter 4, 5, and 6, and then we read 2 Timothy chapter 1 and 2. So I want to go over a little bit of 1 Timothy first. 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in last time some will turn away from true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teaching that come from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars, and their conscience, consciences are dead. Or your version may say they're seared or seared with a hot iron. That means they're branded, like you would brand a slave, or like you would even brand someone with the mark of the beast in end times. You have been branded because you belong to a certain master. Their consciences are branded. We can't see that. It's not a physical brand that we can see. So we have to know Scripture, 2 Timothy 2.15, so that we can tell false doctrines that come into the church. Because what false doctrines have come into the church in Ephesus is that the resurrection has already taken place. There are other false doctrines that are probably there also, and they're quarreling over the meaning of words, and they're quarreling over doctrine. They lose their focus on being the hands and feet of Jesus, so they're not effective there, and they quarrel to the point, if they don't cut that out before it becomes gangrene, that in this case, some have even left the faith. Jesus said that stumblings will occur, but woe to those who cause the stumbling. Stumbling in the church because we quarrel over words. We're not united in mind and spirit. We don't know our focus. We don't build each other up. We don't think of others' needs over our own. Instead, we quarrel over, I think this means this or that means that. And Why? Don't you see? Verse 1 says, Now the Holy Spirit clearly tells us that these doctrines will come into the church. So we have to know the truth, and then we have to rightly divide God's Word from lies and get rid of the lies before they infect the church and destroy the church. 
and then our children and our children's children and our children's children may not even hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The greatest single church planner in history is in prison now facing death and his last letter reaches out to one young disciple. Think about that. Because there's so much division in all the churches, but there's one bright spot, this young Timothy that he's taken. There are probably others too, don't get me wrong, we talked about that Friday. But here we've got the focus on one young man that says, I will sell everything I have. I'll give it all up. I'll deny myself and I'll take up my cross and I'll follow after Jesus. And Paul is worried, as a father is with a son, that Timothy will stumble in his faith. Because we fight a spiritual battle and the devil's been doing this for a long, long time. He's a pro at it. And it is his goal to make you stumble and fall. But you know what? The gates of hell won't prevail. Jesus will build his church. <laughs> but he calls it to happen through us. Through a prayerful, humble, and obedient group of children. So 1 Timothy 1, I'm going to go backwards a second. Started this way just so you'll remember this. In verse 3, when I left Macedonia, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. So that was the week before last. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussions of myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculations which don't help people live a life of faith in God. So what are we called to do? We're called to build up one another so that we do live a holy set-apart life. We're called to learn the truth so we can discern it from a lie. And we're called to preach the gospel message by the way we live and by going over Scripture, by knowing that Scripture. And the more that you study, as we do in Awanas, to be an approved workman, the more that it will come back to you. I constantly go back to memory verses that I learned in Awanas when I was however old, however many years ago that was. <laughs> and they're there because the Holy Spirit reveals them to me. And I think of the joy that I had in Awanas, and I want that to continue on, whether it's my children or someone else's children. I want to help partner with their parents to train up their children where they'll be approved workmen. Verse 5, Paul writes, The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with the love that comes from a pure heart. A clear conscience, not one that's seared, but a clear conscience, and by genuine faith. But some people have missed the whole point. They have turned away from these things and spend their time in meaningless discussions. Now I'm going to throw this in and we'll read it in a minute. But it says the reason they do this is because of their love of money. I don't even seem like it would equate to me in the church. But then I think, and it goes full circle back to what Jesus says, and yeah, we're going to get to that verse that the love of money is the root of all evil, but Jesus said you can't follow two masters. You'll hate one and you'll love the other. You can't serve both God and money. So the whole reason that the people are in the church teaching this hypocrisy is because they love money power, all the things of this world. And I, I, don't even, I wouldn't even think about that except that the Holy Spirit reveals it to me that we're fighting a spiritual war. And we are either going after ourselves rather than denying ourselves. And if we don't deny ourselves, we can never take up a cross, an instrument of suffering and persecution. And we can never follow after Jesus. So why in the world would our children follow that kind of hypocrisy. We have to get rid of it out of the church before it becomes gangrene. So now I'm going to fast forward to 2 Timothy 2, which you read Friday. I'm in verse 14. Remind everyone about these things and command them in God's presence to stop fighting over words that Paul's already talked about. Such arguments are useless and they can ruin those who hear them. Avoid worthless, foolish talk verse 16, that only leads to more godless behavior. This kind of talk spreads like cancer or gangrene, depending on your version. Now, if you notice, I skipped verse 15. 
Because if I had a title for this week's sermon, it would be called Approved Workman. But what does that mean to you? We'll get into that. Okay? So if there are false teachers in the, in the church whose consciences are, have been seared with a hot iron and they follow their master, the devil, they're out for themselves and personal gain and money. That's what motivates them. And Satan is the great deceiver who is going to teach these people that he is trying to devour anyone that he can so that he can destroy them. What are they trying to do to you and your church? Whether they even realize it or not. But they're trying to destroy you and destroy, trying to destroy the church. So if Scripture tells us this, and you see that this is true because you understand the truth that the, the Bible teaches, then we've got to quickly expose this and get it out of the church. Do you agree? It's pretty clear in Scripture. And I praise God that there's not a, a big problem of this in this church. I am so glad. Because I've been in plenty of churches where it's a huge problem. And what normally happens, like we talked about Friday again, is split after split after split. How are, how are those people, the church, God's children, ever going to be effective for the kingdom? What are they going to say the day they have to present themselves to God, whether they're approved and their work is approved or not? when they haven't presented themselves as a living sacrifice, which is wholly acceptable to God and, and a reasonable act of service in the first place. We all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every word, every action, even every thought. And you have been purchased from bondage, from eternal death, by the blood of God's only Son. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. I know I'm taking you all over the place, so I'll tell you where I'm at. Because I went before and afterwards, and now we're going to go back to 1 Timothy 4. I read from verse 1, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last time some will turn away from true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. Realize that's where it comes from. It doesn't come from a chemical imbalance in your brain. It doesn't come from you're tired or ornery or whatever it is. It comes from demons. These people are hypocrites and liars and their consciences are dead because they've been seared, that's been destroyed. They belong to the master, their master, the devil, whether they know it or not. Verse 7 says, Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. Instead, here's the first thing we need to do, train or exercise, I don't know which your version has, yourself to do what? Be godly. It's something you do every day. It's hard. Exercise is hard. The more physically fit someone is, the more they put into being physically fit. From exercise to diet to mental uh, issues to everything else. If you're competing, especially as a professional athlete, do you not train even more? But Paul tells us clearly that we're not... We're not competing for a perishable crown, but an imperishable one. So saying that again, how much should you be training yourself to godliness? A bunch, right? <laughs> and if your children follow after the same pattern generally as you do, how important is it? Verse 8 says, Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Why? Because it promises benefits in this life, which is great. Physical training does that. You might live a longer life. You might be healthier. You, you might have a little better self-esteem, whatever it is. But training for godliness does it not only in this life, but in the life to come. Verse 9, This is a true trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. This is why we work so hard and continue to struggle. 
For our hope is in the living God who is the Savior of all people and particularly of all believers. Verse 11, teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. An approved workman has to be trained. There has to be training going on. There has to be learning what is truth and what is a lie so that you can be trained properly. And you have to realize two things. Number one, you've got to be trained. So number two, so that you can train others. The whole purpose of the Awana program. Isn't that funny? We're getting to this right now in our reading. God is so good. And then verse 16 says, Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teachings. So you can't just teach it, as James said, say it, believe it, and not do it. You would be called a hypocrite. And your actions would be teaching others, whether you realize it or not, to be a hypocrite. Your teaching that you would be teaching them is, children, it's okay to listen to what I say, but not do it. Is that going to work in any family? No, you're going to have to whoop that kid's butt, right? Because he's not going to obey. And the whole purpose is to keep us obeying so that we are instruments of righteousness and holiness. So Paul writes to keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. Timothy, the first and second Timothy and Titus are considered Paul's pastoral letters. And I want to cl clarify that. Because if you get to reading and studying, a lot of commentators are going to say these are Paul's instructions to Timothy and elders and leaders in the church. Baloney. Can I say that from up here? I started to put something else, but I didn't put it. Not anything bad, but something that could be considered, hey, you really meant this type thing. Baloney. I mean baloney. Bologna, if you want to call it bologna. Tomato, tomato. Okri for Merle. Everybody like, what's okri? Okra, but Merle calls it okri. It's okay. Baloney. These words are for every single Christian that ever has been, that ever will be. We are all called to be a disciple. If you want to be a disciple, you have to choose Jesus and nothing else. And you're called to train other disciples. If you don't, then you're stopping the church. But thank goodness that the gates of hell won't prevail Jesus from be building his church. He'll even use your hypocrisy. But woe to you who do that. Woe. You are called to do everything that Paul is telling Timothy. It's not, these aren't words just written to pastors. They're words written to everyone in the church. So that would be a hypocrisy, wouldn't it, if you believe that? A hypocrisy that's been taught. And I could go into a million hypocrisies in the church, but we don't have the time. 1 Timothy 6. Teach these things. I'm in verse 2. Timothy, encourage everyone to obey them. So if Timothy's the one teaching, he is teaching them to the elders, the deacons, the leaders in the church, and everyone else to obey them so that they will then in hand do them. Verse 3, some people may contradict our teaching, but these are wholesome teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Anyone who teaches something different, different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has an unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. This stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions. Evil suspicions. I'm reading NLT. I don't know what your version says. Evil because where their source is from the one who is evil. You might think that just arguing over word or putting in your, I think this or that, and then their little division comes up or a little jealousy comes up, that it wasn't really evil. But that's what Scripture says. You're serving one master or the other. Verse 5, these people always cause trouble. 
Their minds are corrupt and they have turned their back on the truth. That's because their conscience has been seared. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. I told you we'd get to that point. Who would have ever thought that till you read Scripture and think about it and study God's Word so that you can rightly handle the Word of truth? Wealth is what motivates the world, whether they realize it or not. So Paul tells us to be content with what we have because God gives to each according to how He wants to give. And don't forget not only to be content, but to be generous out of giving out of that. Remember the widow who gave out of her poverty, and Jesus said she had given more than everyone gave. He doesn't need your money. He wants and demands your love and obedience, your worship. So verse 6 says, Yet truly true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into this world, and we can take, can't take anything with us when we leave. That's a pretty clear truth there. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, not money, this verse gets misquoted. It's a, a non-truth if you hear it that way, so you need to know how to rightly handle it. The love of money is the root. What happens from a root? A plant grows. A plant grows and produces a fruit that others eat. The love of money is the root that causes this. The love of money is the root of all kind of evils, and some people craving money have even wandered away from the truth and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So Paul tells Timothy to run. He tells Timothy in verse 20 to guard what God has entrusted you. You have a trust from the king of kings, from his kingdom, and you're going to be responsible for how you handle that. So you should avoid godless, foolish destructions with those who oppose you with their so-called knowledge. How many times have I read this in the different chapters? This is in the church. Avoid this bickering, even before it becomes bickering. Just this discussion that can lead to that. Know the truth of God. So how are you going to know the truth of God? Read, study, pray, read some more. We'll get into that more in a minute too. So I asked you before if there are false teachers, if Scripture's clear about that, then shouldn't we be aware of it? Shouldn't we get it out of the church? Shouldn't you be trained so you can handle it? Do you agree? Okay, so now two to five years have passed. We don't know exactly. Paul had expected to go to Ephesus and be with Timothy so he could help him guide this church in the proper direction because of problems in the church again that started with quibbling over words. But now he can't come to Timothy because he is imprisoned and he's facing death. He says, I'm not getting out of this one. And he doesn't want Timothy to depart from the faith because many of them have left and abandoned him. Some of them probably have even departed from the faith. He's alone. He's not in a country club prison. He is in a dark, wet damp cell and the, probably the only reason he gets fed is if somebody brings him food but by the grace of God in that situation he has a pen and a piece of paper or somebody to, to, to take down the information whatever it is so we can have this letter today so Timothy could have that letter then and he tells him to stay strong in his faith <clears throat> Timothy is still at Ephesus Still the same problems in the church. He's young, but it doesn't matter, does it? He has the Spirit of God, the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of him. And Paul is praying for this young man to stay true to the faith. And you know what? We know he stayed true to the faith because we're still here with church today. Plain and simple. So I want to read you the introduction from 2 Timothy. And here's what is written in this particular Bible. Famous last words are more than a cliché. We talked about a cliché before. When notable men and women of influence are about to die, the world waits to hear their final words of insight and wisdom. 
Then these quotes are all repeated worldwide. This is also true with a dying loved one. Gathered at his or her side, the family strains to hear every whispered syllable of blessing, encouragement, advice, knowing what the person's final message will be. Paul is one of these examples. We have his famous last words. So treat 2 Timothy as that. Study this chapter. And don't say, oh, this is just for pastors and elders and not for me. No, it's for you. Convicted as a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, Paul sat in a cold Roman prison, cut off from the world with just a visitor or two and his writing materials. Paul knew that soon he would be executed. 2 Timothy 4, 6. So he wrote his final thoughts to his son, Timothy, passing to him the torch, the flame, of leadership, reminding him of what was truly important and encouraging him in the faith. This is his most intimate and moving of his letters and more than likely his last. He reminds Timothy of the qualifications necessary for a faithful minister of Jesus Christ. He challenges him to reject error and avoid foolish talk, correctly explain the word of truth, and to keep his life pure. Next, Paul warns Timothy of the opposition that he and other believers would face in the last days, even inside the church, from self-centered people who use the church for their own gain and teach false doctrines. Paul teaches Timothy to be prepared for these unfaithful people by remembering his example, understanding the real source of the opposition, which is the devil, the spiritual battle we're facing, and to find strength and power from the Spirit and the Word of God. Then Paul gives Timothy a stirring charge to preach the Word, to fulfill the ministry until the very end. I'm going to stop there because I'm getting into chapter 3, 4, and 5. I don't know if there's three more or two more. I can't remember. So, spoiler alert, read them this week. <clears throat> How can you do your part? What does that say? By being an approved worker. If you don't get anything out of this today, get 2 Timothy 2.15. And it applies to you, not just elders in the church. So the first thing is, do you truly believe? Is your faith genuine? Because if it's not, you might think you have faith, but you might be being led by the other master. And you're never going to discern this word unless you read it. Read it, read it, read it, read it. Not make an excuse why you didn't read it. Not let the master of this world tell you you don't have time this week or whatever it is, and we study it, and we meet together, and we talk about it, and we're able to discern the truth. And if you hear me preach anything that you don't think it is, don't discuss it. Here, come to me and tell me. And let's talk about this and see what we come up with. You know, one of the biggest fears I have is getting up here and teaching you something that's wrong. And that happens time and time again from the pulpit. Whether they're trained and trained and trained, or whether they're not. Because we are doing our best as led by the Spirit to teach this word of truth, to rightly handle it. So in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul wrote in verse 6, This is why I remind you to fan in the flames. Whenever you're starting a fire, you put everything on there that you're going to burn for whatever purpose. Let's use this one as a purpose to build, to build a fire to burn your sacrifice. I like that one. Okay? Which in this case is going to be your body to get rid of all the evil and filth out of it. And you light a flame. The flame is, is, is the Holy Spirit, period. Because there is no flame without that. You're not going to burn your body up and deny yourself without the Spirit, because He's going to be, give you everything that's contract, contrary to the Spirit of the flesh, the Spirit of this world. But then you have to fan that flame. Let me tell you how you can do it real easy. <laughs> Feel the breeze? Yeah. 
Fan the flame. As you turn your Bible and read it, you have to fan the flame. Verse 7, For God has not given you a spirit of fear that you can't preach His Word, or you don't have an obligation, or you're too busy. He hasn't given you a spirit of fear and, tem and timidity. Timidity. I'll get it right. I'm concentrating on Timothy. But instead, He's given you one of power, love, and self-discipline. Now, I don't know if you know it or not, but that self-discipline means a clear mind so that you can discipline yourself. That's why it helps to know those root words. Verse 8 says, So never be ashamed. Makes me think of another verse that the Holy Spirit just puts up. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power to salvation for those who believe. Never be ashamed to tell others of the Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either because that's part of the problem. The people abandoned Paul because they were ashamed of him because he was suffering. Even to the point where there was false doctrine, he must not be a true preacher of righteousness because he's over here suffering in prison. God wouldn't let, him, let that happen to him. That's not the gospel message at all. Jesus said, if they killed me, don't expect him not to kill you. Right? So either you're serving him or you're not. Don't be ashamed of me e either, even though I'm in prison. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer for the sake of the good news. For God called us to live a holy life. Verse 13, hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching, teaching that you learned from me. How would he have learned it if someone wouldn't have discipled him to train up others to be disciples? Verse 14, through the power of the Holy Spirit that's been entrusted you. That's how you're going to make this fire burn till it burns up the sacrifice which is everything that you got rid of out of your life so that you could be wholly acceptable unto God. In chapter 2, Paul goes on to tell him to live a life and he gives him an example of being a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. I hope you read those things. What is a soldier? Not a citizen anymore. He's the fighting part, part of the kingdom. He's part of the kingdom, but he's the fighting part. And Walt said that he was actually like the special forces when we put on that armor that's described in Ephesians. Your life's not your own anymore. You are employed by the king and his kingdom. So you better fight, not desert, because what happens to deserters? And you're an athlete. Any kind of athlete trains to win. You don't train to get second place or for the fun of it. You train to win. And if you're going to win, you have to obey the rules. If you don't obey the rules, what happens? You're disqualified. So we've got, if you leave the army, what's going to happen to you? If you're an athlete that doesn't obey the rules, what's going to happen to you? Then he says you're a hardworking farmer. And the hardworking farmer gets to eat the fruits of his labor. So what happens if you're not a hardworking farmer? You ain't going to eat the fruits of your labor. Now Paul says that the Holy Spirit will guide Timothy further as he studies and reads his word. What this means might just mean if you're not those things, you're not going to be eating at all. I don't know. I've never really thought about this, but I don't know what they eat in hell, do you? I don't want to be a deserter. I don't want to be an athlete who cheats. I need and want, have to be a hardworking farmer so I can have the fruits of my labor. Then Paul puts this poem that I don't know if it was popular in the first church or what, but he says it's a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will live with him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with him, not just live with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he though remains faithful, for he cannot deny who he is. What does 2 Timothy 2.15 read, Sherry, instead of say? Because we quibble over that word, but it's not doctrine. So we're okay. Study to show yourself, not someone else, approved unto who? God, a workman, hardworking farmer, 
that need not to be ashamed because he wasn't a deserter or anything, that rightly divides and handles, I'm going to put both of them in there, the word of truth. Okay? Stuck right in between the verses Merle read this morning. Verse 14 of 2 Timothy 2. Remind everyone about these things. The word that's written there is like the keep on knocking and the keep on acting. It's a constant verb. Keep reminding, keep reminding, keep reminding every single day everyone about all these things that are in here. Not just the elders and the deacons, everyone. And command, the word there is charge, like a military, to charge them according to God. You've got this charge in God's name, taking an oath however you want to say it. Charge them in God's presence. Why? Because they've got to answer, you and I have got to answer to God and no one else. On that day that we present ourselves as a worker who will either be approved or not approved. So I said, if you don't get anything else, get this verse. <clears throat> verse 15. I'm reading NLT, I think. Work. Okay, wait a minute. I didn't finish verse 14. So stop fighting over words. Such arguments are useless and can ruin those who hear them. Total destruction is what ruin means. Verse 15, work hard so that you can present yourself to God and receive His approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. What explains means, and that's why I said divide uh, and use, I don't remember what word I said a second ago, Rightly divide, and handle, sorry, I had to think about it. It means to cut straight along a line. Cut straight God's Word. You cut off any that's not needed and you cut straight so that you don't cut into what is needed. Okay? Avoid, verse 16, or yours might say shun. That's a harder word than avoid. It's not just avoidance, it's get rid of it. Avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to what? More godless behavior. The more you talk this foolish talk, the more you're going down that path to destruction. Why? This kind of talk spreads like cancer, gangrene. You're fanning the flames to others' destruction rather than fanning the flames of the Holy Spirit which will transform you into a new creation in Christ. He goes on to write in verse 23 of chapter 2, Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must, must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. A servant... Not a deacon, not an elder, each and every one of us a servant of Jesus Christ. They must not quarrel, but instead be kind to everyone, able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. Whew, seems like whenever I need a lesson in that, I get one of them in my life. Anyway, <laughs> gently instruct those who oppose the truth. We don't get rid of them first. We instruct them in righteousness. But how are we going to know the truth from the lie to help them because they're being deceived? Who knows? It goes on to say, maybe God will unbrand their conscience. A.W. Tozer wrote, Before the judgment seat of Christ, my service will be judged, not by how much I have done, but how, not by how much I have done, but how much I could have done. In God's sight, my giving is measured not by how much I gave, but how much I have left after I made my gift. Not by its size is my gift judged, but how much of me there is in it. No man gives at all until he has given all. No man gives anything acceptable to God 
until he has first given himself in love and sacrifice. Why do we get an education? The world teaches to get an education. Most of you have put, sent your kids through school, right? You give them an education so they can learn, better themselves, and equip themselves for the future. Whether you've gone to college and everything so that you can have a high up position in a company, or whether you're a skilled laborer, you learn the job so you can perform it so it provides for you in the future. Get this. This life is for eternity. How you train and learn will affect you for all eternity. You better be working for the kingdom. You better be that good soldier, that athlete, that hardworking farmer. And you better be able to rightly handle this word of truth. It is the Awana motto. That's what Awana stands for. It's an acronym. Approved workmen are not ashamed. The King James Version says 2 Timothy 2.15 this way. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. New International Version. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. New Living. Work hard so you can present yourself to God and receive His approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. English Standard Version. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has, who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The Berrien Study Bible. Make every effort to present yourself approved to God, an unashamed workman who accurately handles the word of truth. And the uh, New American Standard Bible. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. God will evaluate you. Period. He will evaluate your work to see how you've handled and what He's entrusted you with. You are an ambassador. This is a foreign land. We should live as aliens here. And the only way you're going to get His truth is through here. Yes, the Spirit is going to reveal it to you. And if you don't have genuine faith, you don't have the Spirit. But the Spirit is going to reveal Jesus Christ, the Word, made flesh and dwelling among us. That every word is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Another one is a verse you're going to read this next week. And that was the Old Testament, guys. <laughs> the New Testament was being written. So you've got to consider how you are going to be evaluated as a worker for the kingdom when you meet Jesus Christ face to face. Why in the world would you go spend time and effort on an education and not use it? Why would you avoid being educated? You know you're not going to stand a good chance in the future. You're going to be a homeless bum. Do you want to be a homeless bum for all eternity? I'm going to tell you it's going to be worse than a homeless bum. It's heaven or hell. Approved comes from the Greek word dokimus. I don't have Walt here to tell me if I said it wrong. In Paul's day, all money was metal coin. There wasn't paper money. Metal coins have to be sh metal has to be shaped into coins. So you take an object and you shape it and transform it into something totally different. Who would have ever believed before we coined money that metal would be made into coins? It's totally transformed. Okay, the metal is first melted. It's heated to the point that it's melted. Now stop. I'm talking about you. Okay. Then it's poured into a mold. Jesus Christ is the mold. That's why we fix our eyes on Him. Then it's cooled so that it can be shaped. <laughs> it takes that pounding and stuff on it. Then all the rough edges have to even be taken off. Then it's stamped with an image of its owner. Whether it's Caesar and his money in those days, or in the case of you again, 
whether your conscience is seared and branded with the devil's mark or whether you carry the mark of Jesus Christ because you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. There were dishonest people that shaved money off of these coins. That's why everything was weighted and measured to see if it stood the test. Because people would shave off minor little amounts thinking it wouldn't matter. But as greed got into their hearts more, they'd shave a little more and a little more off. And what happened if you were in the empire and you presented money that had been shaved? Whether you shaved it or not, you better have tested this to make sure it was tried and true money. Because if you gave this money that was shaved in the emperor to the emperor, you would be killed because you stole from Caesar himself. Now what do you think is going to happen if you shave something off your life, what God's entrusted you for all eternity? What do you think he's going to say about that? That's the word that's being used here. So I, I'm going to think before I shave anything off. I'm going to study to be approved. I'm not going to cheat the King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm going to give up my life for the one that gave up his life for me. So what can you do? Read. Pray for your eyes. I'm going to read this because I wrote this all down. and It's repetitive, but it's not. You'll understand. Read, right? And of course you're going to hear read again and again and again. Pray for your eyes and ears to be opened. Read some more. Pray to be used by God. Read some more. Pray for spiritual gifts. Read some more. Study. Meditate. Read some more. Pray for holiness. Read some more. Study. Pray for opportunities. Read some more. Study. Pray for where He can use me in Awana. <laughs> and then on that day, when you have to present yourself to Jesus you know without a doubt that you'll be an approved worker. And you know what? Besides that, you'll have a Timothy following you and a Timothy following him and a Timothy following him. Why would you want to live your life for anything else but to be an approved workman that needs not to be ashamed, that can rightly handle this truth? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for Timothy, for Paul, and all the Timothys that are out there. Oh God, help us not to shave anything off, but to give it all to you, to be good stewards and to study your word. I thank you for this church that doesn't quibble over words. I thank you for the spirit that indwells us. And Lord, I pray that we won't have any fear or timidity or anything else, but that we'll train up in the Iwana program and outside of the Iwana program, that we'll train others to be approved workmen. Father, we just lean to your faithfulness, to your words, that we know that your word will not come back void, that if we do train up our children, that they'll follow after you. Father, we thank you and praise you for your word, and we long for the day when Jesus Christ returns and we meet him face to face. We pray this in his precious name. Amen.